Uh, we uh, are back in Genesis. If you remember, we were in Genesis a whole lot last year. We're going to get back into it for a while this year. And it's a series that I've uh, been doing with my friend Dave McCants, and it's entitled Back to the Start. And so today we're going to be in Genesis chapter 24. Genesis chapter 24. Many of you in here are married. And uh, some longer than others, but you can remember the day in which you wedded uh, your spouse. And uh, it was a glorious day, I hope. You know, some may have been better than others, but I don't know. It was a glorious day for me. I can still remember, it's hard to believe, that in just a couple months, it will be 21 years uh, that Dee Dee and I were married. Uh, we were young, we were just kids, uh, but we got married. I remember being in my, I still remember putting on my white suit. I had a white tux, it was sweet. I had a sweet white tux on, and Dee Dee had white dress with big hair, and uh, we were there at the Horse Pasture Christian Church where we got married. Beautiful building with the stained glass windows and a, a historic building, and there were over 300 people there at the wedding. And, I'm there waiting in anticipation and Dee Dee comes forward and we stood there and made those promises uh, to one another. I would say that our wedding was a match made in heaven. And I believe, but I believe that all marriages, all marriages are we to understand that marriage is to be a match made in heaven. That that's what God intended for it to be. And we're going to look today at marriage through the eyes of God found in Genesis chapter 24. Before we get started, let me read Genesis 24, 1 through 4, because you may read through here, and you're going to come across this passage, and you're going to say, what in the world does that mean? So I'm going to let you know, this is what this means, this is the culture, the idea behind this, and then we'll get into the main thrust of the message. But Genesis 24, 1 through 4 says this, Abraham was now very old, and the Lord had blessed him in every way. He said to the senior servant in his household, the one in charge of all that he had, put your hand under my thigh. I want you to swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will, that you will not get a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I am living, but will go to my country and my own relatives and get a wife for my son Isaac. Now that goes along with what we're saying, but there's one part in there that you may be saying, that's kind of weird. I mean, you probably caught it. I thought when I read it, I was like, that's weird. He said to a senior servant in his household, the one in charge, put your hand under my thigh. Easy. <laughs> you know, that's what in our culture today, at least I'm not <laughs> going to go up and make an agreement with another man and say, hey, put your hand under my thigh. And I know if I went up to some of you and said that, I'm probably going to end up with not your hand under my thigh, but with a black eye. And uh, rightfully so. But Abraham was asking his servant to promise to go and find his only son, his, 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 his one and only son Isaac, a wife. Not from the Canaanites, but from Abraham's own family and Abraham's own country. And when someone is asked to take an oath, typically they put their hand on something that is sacred. And the Jewish custom at this time was similar to the custom that we have, that when we go into a court of law, we go somewhere like we put our hand on the Bible. That is something that is sacred. And we say that we promise that we are going to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And so the Jewish oath would be taken while putting one's hand on a Torah scroll a small, or small black leather cubes containing parchment scrolls inscribed with the Shema and other biblical passages. And the placing of one's hand on a man's thigh was essentially the same in the Jewish community. Okay, What they were saying is, I swear on the mitzvah that I am telling the truth. And I swear on this mitzvah that we are going to to keep this covenant, and you are promising to me, and your word is truth. And they didn't sign necessary agreements and do all the things that we did. If you did something to this to symbolize that you were telling the truth, then your word was truth. What you said, your word was, as we say, your word is law. And so the mitzvah, which literally means commandment, this was the uh, name of the 613 divine commandments given in the Torah or in the five books of the Old, the first five books of the Old Testament. So they're making this was uh, this this was 
uh, the making of a covenant. And so to put his hand on Abraham's thigh was close to the place where that first painful, sacred, meaningful, and spiritual command was fulfilled through circumcision. And so it was, it was close to that area, and this was to bring attention to the ser of the servant how serious Abra Abraham was about asking him what he asked him to do, which was to go out and to find a wife for his son Isaac, but not from the Canaanite people. And so verse 9 reads, So the servant put his hand under the thigh of his master Abraham and swore an oath to him concerning this master this matter. So he agrees, he makes a contract, he makes a covenant with Abraham, he swears on the mitzvah, the most holy commandment to fulfill his master's wishes. And then we get here, we get marriage in the eyes of God. Verses 1 and 2 again, listen, make sure that you do not you do not take my son back there, Abraham said. The Lord, the God of heaven, who brought me out of my uh, father's household and my native land, and who spoke to me, promised an oath, saying to your offspring, I will give this land. He will send his angel before you, so you can get a wife for my son from there. If the woman is unwilling to come back with you, then you will be released from this oath of mine. Only do not take my son back there. So the servant put his hand on the thigh of his master, Abraham, and swore an oath to him concerning this matter. In a good marriage, or in a great marriage, in a marriage that is made in heaven, in the eyes of God, God is involved. Simple, simple fact. God is going to be involved. From the very beginning of this story, God was involved in Isaac and Rebekah's marriage. The angel of the Lord went before Abraham's servant to give him success. God wants to be involved in your marriage even before you are married. God wants to be involved in it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14-16, through 16, it says, Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. And so what it's saying there is that from the very beginning, me as a Christian, when I was a, a young man and looking for a spouse, looking for somebody, I was dedicated to the Lord. I was wanting to serve the Lord. I was wanting to be in the ministry. So I needed to find somebody that has the same thing in common with me, which was a relationship with Christ. And so as Christians, from the very beginning, God says, I want my people to be involved with other people, with my people. If that makes sense. He, when he says, I want you to go, I don't want you to go to the land of Canaan. Not that these people, God created the Canaanites, but those people were rebellious and they were pagans. And God said, I don't want you to intermarry with these type of people, not because of their race, but because of their religion. They were not serving the one true God. And so God wants us to be yoked together equally. From the very beginning, He's saying, I want to be involved in your marriage from the get-go. And I want you to marry Christians and Christians only. I've tried to instill this in my children. I've tried to say, you need to marry a Christian and a Christian only because if you don't, there's going to be problems. And when I talk to and do premarital counseling, one's a believer, one's not a believer, uh, I discourage that because there's going to be problems later on down the line as far as when the believers, because they have to have that common. Dee Dee and I have said it before, a hundred times before, Dee Dee and I are total opposites. I mean, it's, it, it's obvious. You're around us and you will see that we are opposite. And people say, how did we get together? How y'all stay together for 21 years? Blah, blah, blah. I'll tell you how we stay together. Because if it wasn't for Jesus Christ, we wouldn't be together. She'd have been gone a long time ago. And I told her before, she would have found another man like that. That's my man, that's that. But, uh, but we, we wouldn't be. It's Jesus that put us together and God, and it's what keeps us together. We know that we're going to be there through the thick and through the thin, no matter what. Even when there's times where we don't really like each other. And those times come where we don't want to be around each other. We don't like each other. But guess what? Neither one of us are going anywhere. I'm not planning on it. And even if we hit rough times, I'm planning on 
I'm trying to do all that I can to work out whatever it is with Dee Dee. I made a covenant and I made a commitment with her. God is involved in that. And that's why I tell people that if your marriage, people say, oh, man, you're, you're crazy. Well, you got the perfect man. You got the perfect spouse. Oh, we're not perfect. But we work on our marriage and we have God in our relationship. And that's what keeps us together. God wants to be involved in your marriage for your whole life. David Canson, who I'm working on uh, these sermons with, we were talking about our grandparents. My grandparents were married 66 years. 66 years before my grandmother died. And God was involved in their marriage from the very beginning. They made a commitment. My grandfather was always serving the Lord. My grandmother was raised in the church. And when they got together, they said, we're going to build this relationship upon God. They raised two daughters who are still in the church today. And most of their families are in the church today. Because they built a relationship on that. I remember my grandfather, and they, and they had a, they just had a good, a good time, and, and but they loved the Lord, Lord and served the Lord. One of my favorite things about uh, uh, when my grandmother and grandfather were dating, my grandfather was in World War II. He didn't see a whole lot of action. He went over to uh, I can't even remember where he went. He, he was overseas somewhere, and uh, not a whole lot of correspondence with the states. But he had met my grandmother. The, the army had sent him to business college, uh, so he. To, do something, I don't know. But he went to business college. That's where he met my grandmother, business college in Kansas. And uh, then they sent him overseas. And they sent him overseas, and she hadn't heard from him in a long time. So she sent him a note. She just sent him a note that simply said, Is your arm broken? <laughs> sent the note to him. He was, she got a letter. You, it took a while. A few months later, I, I believe they said, got a letter. She opens up. She's excited. She opens it up, and all it says on it is, nope. <laughs> <laughs> but they, but they had a relationship built on that. They talked about his grandparents were married 76 years. 76 years before his grandfather passed away this past year. Many of you may know Mr. Marvin Rose from Beaufort County, down in the Pantiga area. God was always part of their relationship, what Dave says. He says, my grandfather used to tell me of how he would travel by wagon to see his grandmother. And they would go to church together before they were married. And they were married at, uh, uh, at each other. They were married to each other. And every evening meal, they would read scripture together as a family. They involved God in their relationship. See, God knows more about marriage than Oprah Winfrey. I'm just going to tell you that. God knows more about marriage than Dr. Phil. God knows more about marriage than Dr. Oz. Or any of the other shows or any other advice you can get on when you type in on the internet. God knows the most. The old pyramid illustration is so true. God at the top. You and your spouse at the bottom. The closer you get to God, the closer you're going to get to one another. It's a fact. I believe it. I live it. I guarantee it. It works. Marriage is from God. Marriage is intentional. Marriage is intentional. Listen to this. Then he prayed, Lord, God of my master Abraham, make me successful today and show kindness to my master Abraham. See, I'm standing beside the spring and the daughters of the townspeople are coming out to draw water. May it be when I say to a young woman, Please let down your jar that I may have a drink. And she says, drink, and I'll water your camels too. Let her be the one you have chosen for your servant Isaac. By this I will know that you have shown kindness to my master. Before he had finished praying, Rebecca came out, came out with her jar on her shoulder. She was the daughter of Bethuel, son of Milcah, who was the wife of Abraham's brother Nahor. The woman was very beautiful, a virgin. No man had ever slept with her. She went down to the spring, filled her jar, and came up again. See, marriage is intentional. That means marriage is from God, and marriage is spiritual, but marriage is intentional. It's on purpose. We don't just necessarily fall in love. It's not an accident. We purposely look to grow in love with somebody to find the right person. I joke around about Olivia. Olivia's always breaking something. 
And I just talked to her this week. She's always breaks. If she comes to your house, God bless you. Put your stuff up. <laughs> I'm just telling you, just put, move it around, put it up. She's, uh, my mom calls her Grace, uh, and we joke her about that. We probably shouldn't give her such a hard time, but her name should have been Olivia Grace uh, instead of Olivia Caroline. But she's just, yeah, she's getting ready for the CCYC, and uh, she's, she grabs her stuff and she walks by something in the dining room. Boom, blanket hits. Bam, ching, something breaks all over. You didn't know about that, did you? Anyway, I'll show you. <laughs> I'll show you when I go home. I said, you always break something. Break she said, hey, I'm not. She turned around and knocked something off the table. I said, stop. Stop. But I always break something. And it is an accident. I was just, I just wrote, uh, was it Friday evening? I don't know if anybody saw it. It was Friday evening. Um, I had gone to the hospital uh, to see Jennifer on my way back. Uh, there at Sheets right up here, there was a bad wreck right up here at the intersection of 10th Street and Portertown Road. They had traffic blocked. It was all, I mean, there was, I had it blocked for a long way away. A bad accident took place. We wrote by and said, that was an accident. We don't think somebody intentionally came and bam, ran into somebody so that they could hold traffic up and go through all of that process. That's an accident. And I'm not mad when, when there's an accident or a mistake, or I try not to be. Um... But we need to make sure that we understand that our relationships are not necessarily accidents. It's going to be intentional. Sometimes we get the idea that relationships are okay if we fall into them, but I don't believe we should treat love and relationships as if they were a mistake. See, in a good marriage, it's intentional. In a good marriage, God's will is respected. And see, God's will is... That it is relationally. See, y'all remember, uh, y'all remember that Jack I told about the country, the, the couple that was arguing, and they were riding through the countryside. Y'all remember they ride through the countryside and they look over and the, the man sees a field with hogs in it, and uh, he says to uh, he says to his wife, "In laws of yours." <laughs> I mean, no, I messed it up. He said relatives of yours. She says, "Yeah, in laws." I messed it up. <laughs> <laughs> that last one hurt. <laughs> but anyway, we, uh, the relation, to build relationships, strong relationships to one another and have mutual respect for each other. Ephesians 5, 21 through 27 says, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to yourself, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands and everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. See, it's a relationship, it's relational, uh, relationally that is there. And it, it is the respect that is there for one another, the love and the respect and uh, being there. God's will is that. And God's will is physically. You may have heard the comedian Henry Youngman. He said, do you know what it means to come home at night to a woman who will give you a little love, a little affection, and a little tenderness? He said, it means you're in the wrong house. That's what it means. <laughs> But Hebrews 13, 4 says, Marriage should be honored by all, and the marriage bed kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. 1 Corinthians 7, 3 and 4 says, The husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife, and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but yields it to her husband. In the same way, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but yields it to his wife. And so relationally, physically, they go hand in hand. And that leads in marriage is spiritual, marriage is intentional, and marriage is relational. And we'll build upon that. Listen to this. Genesis 24, 57 through 67 says, Then they said, Let's call the young woman and ask her about it. So they called Rebecca and asked her, Will you go with this man? I will go, she said. So they sent... Uh, their sister Rebecca on her way along with her nurse and Abraham's servant. Now, what we have here is that he goes up and she's one that's willing to draw him some water and all those things we talked about. Now they'll go back to the house to make sure to talk and to make sure this is what we're good. And she's like, I'll go. 
So they, uh, so our sister may may go with you, increase to thousands upon thousands. May your offspring uh, possess the cities of their enemies. Then Rebecca and her attendants got ready, mounted the camels, and went back with the man. So the servant took Rebecca and left. Now Isaac had come from Beer Lahai Roy. He was living in the Negev. He went out to the field one evening to meditate. And he looked up and he saw camels approaching. Rebecca also looked up and saw Isaac. She got down from her camel and asked the servant, Who is this man in the field coming to meet us? He is my master, the servant answered. So she took her veil, so she took her veil and covered herself. Then the servant told Isaac all he had done. Isaac brought her into the tent of his mother Sarah, and he married Rebekah. So she became his wife, and he loved her, and Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. See, in a great marriage, relationships are transferred. The relationship is transferred from Isaac and Sarah to Isaac and Rebekah. See, we're made to leave and to cleave. Then the Lord God in Genesis 22 made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man and he brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. That's important that we understand this relationship. The most important person in my life right now is Didi. I stand up for Didi. More important than my children. And I love my children. would do anything for them. But the best thing I can do for my children is to have a right relationship with God and with Didi. And teach them what marriage is all about. And that will make them stronger. And they'll appreciate that and give them the security that they need because they know mom and dad love each other and they're going to stay together. They're the most important thing. I tell my kids all the time, I say, you're going to be gone one day. I'm going to find out what your mama wants first. <laughs> and my parents love Didi more than they love me. They did. They loved Diddy. Now, my mama might not, but she had. I can tell Diddy that. But, uh, <laughs> my mama knew him. And then, uh, I'm a mama for love. But anyway, my mom, if my mom came to the point where she did not like Diddy and tried to bring it, bring it, be a wedge between me and Diddy, my responsibility is I left my mama. And I cleave to Diddy. And I would have to stand up for Diddy. Anyway, and the same way, she left her mama and her daddy and she cleaves to me and she, I'm the most important person in her life here on earth besides our relationship with God and she sees my need more important than her extended family, her mother and her father. And we're there for each other. Even though we're close to both. We're close to her mom and her dad. Close to my mom and my dad. We've never had any problems with that like some people have. But the reason being, I think, too, they know it's DJ and it's Didi. And we're together and we love each other. And the relationship is transferred. And we appreciate that relationship. And we have to do that for a relationship to work. You heard about the couple that went to Paris to celebrate their 25th wedding anniversary. When they returned, one of the friends went to the man and said, Man, that's something. 25 years you took her to Paris. He said, Wait till 50 years comes up. What are you going to do? He said, I'm thinking about going back and getting her. The, uh, <laughs> But great relationships, great relationships too, find their sweet spot as one flesh. They're a team. And they come together. If you notice in here, the physical aspect of the relationship is important. And that consummates a marriage. Rebecca was a virgin when they got married. Isaac, we assume, was a virgin. They came together and the marriage was consummated. And so when you come together, you, in that way, you are one flesh, you are one team. See, God wants our marriages to be strong. And marriage is under attack today like never before. Like never before, man. God, Satan is going after them nonstop. He's going after men. He's going after women in marriages. He's attacking. It doesn't make any difference if you're in the church or you're out in the world. He's attacking marriages. We need to stand strong and understand that we can have a match made in heaven. We can have a marriage in the eyes of God. And it takes two to do that. But all you can do, you may be saying and sitting out there thinking, man, that sounds all fine, that sounds all dandy, but my spouse wants nothing to do with that. You do your part. That's all you can do is your part. And you do what God would have you to do.
do in your relationship and in your marriage. And you ultimately find your strength and your security and your significance in God in a right relationship with Him. And then you will be fulfilled and you have the self-esteem that you need. And then you be the wife or you be the husband that God intended you to be. Because you may have a spouse that's not a Christian. You may, have, you may be unequally yoked at this particular time. Or your spouse may not be where you are. All you can do is do what you're supposed to do. First Peter teaches that, talking to wives, but it's the same for husbands. Talking to wives there, it says, love, cherish, be there for your husband. Do these things. And maybe you'll win your husband. Maybe you'll win your wife. Maybe it's to the point where you're, in a, you're separated right now. Pray to God like never before that it will open up the heart of your spouse that maybe you can come back together. But maybe you're in a relationship, you may say, man, I'm on my second marriage, my third marriage, my tenth marriage. Um, you know, like uh, old, uh, what's her name, Elizabeth Taylor said, uh, I used to say that when I used to get up and speak a lot. I'm going to do as Elizabeth Taylor told her first nine husbands. I'm not going to keep you very long. <laughs> anyway, but, you, know, you may be on these, on these there, but make the marriage the covenant that you are in a match made in heaven. And keep that covenant and keep that commitment. And be all that you can be. And ultimately, it's found in a right relationship with God. Plug yourself in. Grow in the grace and the faith and knowledge of Jesus Christ. And, and espouse that to your spouse. Don't push those things on if they're not there where you are. But just let them know and let them see it in you. That you love them, that you care for them, and that you're going to be there and work on that relationship. God wants our marriages to be strong. And there's a great example here beginning of Isaac and Rebecca's marriage. There's going to be problems in their marriage. And we'll see those. But the marriage is the way that it started. It's the way that God intended it to start. The way He intended it to end. I don't know where you are today in your relationships. Maybe you're struggling today in your marriage. I want you to know this. We serve a God who raised His Son from the dead. And the resurrection of Jesus Christ teaches us that nothing is out of His reach or, or beyond His power. God can take your marriage, your dead marriage, and He can raise it from the dead. I see it done. He can do it if you allow Him to do it. And if that's where you are today, your marriage is... What they say, it's on the rocks or it's way down here. Turn it over to God. Let go and let God, but don't uh, let go completely. Do your part. And begin to let God perform a resurrection in your marriage. If you're in a relationship that's broken completely up, and you feel like you're a failure, you're not. People mess up and things happen. But you turn to God and you pray to God and you turn your sin, you turn all your problems over to Him and God will raise you up and God will lift you up and surround yourself with people of like precious faith and be encouraged and be built up and be edified and put the past behind you as the Apostle Paul said in Philippians chapter 3 verse 13 and strive for what God has ahead and begin to do the things that God would have you to do. Strong marriage right now continue to work on that. Because Satan's trying to work. Satan's trying to work in mine. He comes in mind all the time. He works on me. Constantly. Works in my flesh. Works with my mind. Works with all kinds of different things. And I'm constantly having to battle Satan. So then, do the things that will make your marriage strong. Take time for each other. There was a reason. There was a reason. And I think about this at times. There was a reason that I worked at a church camp mowing grass, driving a tractor with, in a hundred and some degree weather with <coughs> deer flies flying around my head. I was completely covered from head to toe and wrapped around. I looked like a muzzle. I had my head wrapped over the seat with my eyes. Because I was raising enough money and I was having a weekend youth ministry so that I could buy her a diamond ring. That's something. I worked every bit of that money went towards buying her a ring. There was a reason I did that. There was a reason why I wore a white suit. Why I put on a silly white suit. And stood up in front of all these people. 
Saying lovey dovey things and listening to love songs and all that stuff. And it was a real when we invited all those people, went through all that plan and all those things, wore that dress, had all that stuff. There was a reason why we went through all of that. Sometimes we got to find what that reason was and get back to it. And find your first love. There's a reason that God put you together. Find out what that reason was. Find out what it was when your marriage starts falling. What was it that attracted you to this person in the first place? Because sometimes the thing that attracted you to the person in the first place is the thing that's driving you crazy right now. But you need to say, hey, this is what brought me this person is unique in the eyes of God. I'm going to love them and care for them because I made a covenant and a commitment with them in the eyes of God. Maybe today you're not in the right relationship with God. And maybe why your marriage and other things in your life are out of control. Because when you see, you know, when, when God is right in life, everything else comes into perspective. There can be financial problems, there can be other things that come your way, but in the end you realize, hey, this world's not my home. And God's going to make it through today, this day. And so maybe you need to enter into a marriage, a right marriage with God through His Son, Jesus Christ, so that your marriages and other relationships and other affairs can be made right here on this earth. See, the Bible says that Christ is the bridegroom. The church is the bride. So if you want to become part of the bride and marry the bridegroom, you'll have that opportunity today. Scripture simply says you need to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. You need to repent of your sins. Say, no longer my Lord, but Jesus Christ is Lord. And confess with your mouth a confession of faith that Jesus Christ is Lord. And be baptized, immersed into Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and the gift of God's Holy Spirit and raised to walk in a new life. You'll have a new perspective on life. You'll be in a right relationship, married to Christ. And then that'll help you in other areas of your life as you grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus. But whatever your decision is, whatever it is, get right with Him today. Get right with God so that you can have a right perspective on life every day. God in heaven, I come to you now and I thank you for this message from your word. As we go back in Genesis and we look and we see how Isaac and Rebecca came together and how Abraham was involved in this, but ultimately Abraham was involved because you were involved and they prayed to you to lead them and to guide them and direct them to the right word to put together this covenant relationship. And we're going to see from Isaac and Rebecca how a nation is born. And, uh, and, and see how your will and your plan unfolds because this relationship, you were in it from the beginning. This is what you intended. And so right now, I'm praying for all the marriages here at the Eastern Pines Church of Christ. There may be some marriages in here that are struggling and that are, that are, that are just, some are saying, I don't know how it's going to work. I don't know what's happening. I don't know what I got myself into. I'm praying for those marriages now. I'm praying that those couples involved in that, are, their hearts are turning and they're going to turn to you. They're going to seek help from godly people to get their relationship where it should be. But ultimately, they're going to depend upon your power your grace and your mercy to raise this dead marriage and to bring it back to life once again. Some in here, their marriage is completely broken and they're separated. Some in here are divorced. And I'm praying for them that they'll find their significance and security ultimately in you and that they will, will be able to put the past behind them and strive for what's ahead. Those of us in here that are married, and we understand and that we'll constantly be aware that we need to work on our relationships. And we'll do all that we can to constantly keep you first. If there's somebody in here I know that needs to get in the right relationship with you first and foremost so that they can begin to have marriage relationships and other affairs where they should be. So I pray now for them that they need to come forward and make Jesus Christ Lord. And they'll do that at this time. I pray this in the name of Jesus.